Several years ago, a, a highly controversial experiment took place without anybody knowing. A giant social media platform decided to experiment on over half a million of its users to see the effects of the content we consume on our well-being. They did this by showing half of them exclusively positive content, and then the other, less fortunate half, exclusively negative content, and the results were conclusive. Those who had been shown exclusively positive content themselves became more positive. Those who'd been shown exclusively negative content themselves became more negative. It's a pretty unethical study, uh, but it empirically proved an important point. We become like the content we consume. We become like the content we consume. Just like a physical diet where what we put into our body is the physical health that we get out, well, evidently, the content we put into our minds is the spiritual and mental health that we get out. In some sense, we become like the people we spend time with. We become like the TV we watch, the music we listen to, the books and papers we read, the stuff that we scroll. These things are never neutral. They are shaping us. They are transforming us for better or for worse. We're back in our series in Philippians. This is a book, if you've been with us, it's a book all about joy. And we've said that joy is a deep soul-level gladness that transcends our situation. So joy, therefore, it is distinct from happiness. Happiness goes up and down, very much dependent on our situation. But joy can remain in, remain in place independent of our situation. For example, Paul wrote this letter on joy in jail. It's a bad situation and yet full of joy. What was his secret? Well, this book reasons that true joy is found in knowing and following Jesus, that any suffering we might be facing can be consumed by the greater realities of what Jesus gives us in the gospel, namely peace with God, a global church family, eternal hope, and others. You see, joy, happiness can be found here, but joy can't be found in health, in wealth, or in anything else that can be taken from us. Joy can only be found, true joy can only be found in Jesus, who can never be taken from us. C.S. Lewis said that joy, therefore, is one of the most desirable things in the universe. Who here would want to be more joyful? Everyone. Everyone. And so we're, we're right near the end of this book now, and Paul is now into giving sort of concrete, practical advice on how we take hold, how we find joy and how we keep hold of it in Jesus. And he starts chapter 4, if you want to take a look again just at the start of chapter 4, he starts by saying, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. And then if you've been with us, he, he spoke about keeping our relationships healthy in the local church. He then spoke about taking our anxieties to God in prayer. That was last time. Today, just two verses in verse 8 and 9, he's going to help us very practically by telling us to keep check of the content we consume. Have a look at me again at verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. You see, the big idea there, it is that we become the content we consume. As we seek together as a church to, chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. As we seek to do that together as a church, we need to consciously think, dwell, meditate, fill our minds 
with what is spiritually constructive, not destructive. Let's just look at those two things of spiritually constructive, spiritually destructive. Firstly, don't expect joy whilst consuming junk. Don't expect joy whilst consuming junk. You see, if what Paul says here is true, that joy and peace come our way when we focus on, verse 8, look at the list again, what's true, that's truth in an objective sense. Not just what's true for you, but true, true. What is noble, meaning worthy of respect. What's right, that is a, that's a legal word, meaning legally right. What's pure, that's a moral word, meaning morally right. What's lovely, it's a bit of a naff word in the English language, isn't it? That really just means related, things relating to love, things done out of love. And then what's admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy, these are all action words, the actions that we want to encourage in ourselves and in our society. If joy comes our ways when we focus and dwell on those things, well then, the opposite is presumably true. That when we dwell on things that are Contrary to truth, provoking hatred, damaging to society, that joy will evade us. Because we become like the content we consume. I imagine many of us here today, many of us love Jesus. We want joy, but we have a junk food diet. We love Jesus. We want joy, but we have a junk food diet. Think about this. We humans are consuming more content than ever nowadays. According to a study last year, the average Brit now spends two and a half hours every single day on social media, four hours on TV, and six hours on the internet. That's nine hours if you're a teenager. Now, if the math doesn't seem to add up there, that is because we are now watching TV and scrolling media simultaneously. Most of this content is junk food for our brains. Why is social media free to use? They make billions. Why is it free to use? It's because we're the product. Social media they are, is quite openly addicting you so that it can advertise to you. That's how it makes money. And so naturally, by design, it is filled with hyper-addictive content like soft porn, clickbait, angry comments, Fake news. Lies famously travel six times faster on the internet than truth. So social media is very happy to push this kind of content on us. It's junk food. It's cheap, tasty, bad for our heart. Two and a half hours a day on social media is probably the equivalent of two and a half hours of eating chicken nuggets every day for your brain. Uh, If your social media of choice is TikTok, it's like two and a half hours of drinking Red Bull. It is not not going to be doing you any favors. I've never seen someone that's tried to drink Red Bull for two and a half hours, but I imagine that's bad. Um, now look, many of you might think, oh, fine, I'm not on social media. Many of you might go for something a bit more cultured and truthful with uh, daily news on TV and radio. And look, I just wanted to say that whilst the news might tell you the truth, It rarely focuses on other things in this list, what is noble, what is right, pure, and praiseworthy. Rather, again, the news is incentivized to give us bad news because it attracts more ears and eyes. As the famous line goes, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. I spoke to a journalist who said that they are actually trained to find bad news stories even inside good news stories because they'll get more attention. For example, if life expectancy decreases, people are dying younger. But if life expectancy increases, it's a strain on society. If if there's an unpreventable uh, disease, it harms people. If there's a preventable disease, good news, but it shows that there's disproportionate access to treatment in society. High birth rate, that causes overcrowding. Low birth rate, That's going to cause school closures. You see, this is how the news works. If it bleeds, it leads. It's incentivized to give us bad news. And let me underline, there is nothing wrong with watching the news every day, uh, reading the newspapers, but recognize it almost always reports on the fallenness of the world. 
It brings tragedy from every corner of the world to my sofa. It gives me a constant barrage of disagreements and disasters that I can do nothing about. As I said before, it is a program that starts with the words, good evening, and then continues to tell you exactly why it isn't. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary word of the year in 2020 was doom scrolling. Any of you heard that? It's this, um, it describes a, a behavior that many of us now do, which is a compulsive scrolling for increasingly shocking news stories. It's as if modern people have become addicted to disaster and drama. Doom scrolling. All of this, of course, is having a negative impact on our lives. One in five of us are now anxious most or all of the time. This is according to the latest statistics. One in five of us are now taking antidepressant medication. 80% of us believe that we have become more angry. All of these figures are rising. And of course, it's very hard to know all of the complex reasons why that is the case. But I don't think we should expect joy when all we're consuming is junk, when all we are consuming is the fallenness of the world. Joy is elusive because sin is pervasive. We, we consume this stuff, but really it's consuming us. So let me ask you, what, what does your search history say about your soul? If I came and looked at your algorithm, could, could you use these words to describe the, the average thing you watch? Could you use these words here in verse 8 to describe the average content that you're consuming in the week? Because be in no doubt, you become like the content you consume. And you shouldn't expect joy whilst consuming junk. But secondly, expect joy when consuming Jesus. Now, there, there is a reason that I've tried to summarize Paul's list here as Jesus. Uh, this is because he is the context of the letter throughout. He is the preeminent embodiment of all of these virtues and qualities. You see, this isn't an encouragement towards just shallow, positive thinking at the end of Paul's letter, as some people might think. As if Paul has spent a whole letter magnifying the glorious and victorious Jesus, talking about the, the absolute necessity of knowing Jesus for salvation and joy, only to conclude his letter by saying, anyway, always look on the bright side of life. Um, this is not shallow, positive thinking. Just th life sucks, but hey, think about puppies and good hair days. It's not shallow positive thinking. This is rich positive thinking, calling us away from constantly focusing on the corruption and fallenness of the world to focus on him, to focus on him, the source of joy, the conqueror of death, the giver of life, the restorer of the universe. He alone is the cure to joylessness. Because he alone is the solution to all of our biggest problems. Sin, curse, death, hell. Everything you see that's bad on the news, he is the solution. He alone is the fulfiller of all of our greatest desires. Of, for love, for truth, for meaning, for rest. This is an impassioned call to consciously meditate on Christ. This is an impassioned cry to consume Christ. Verse 8, he is what is most truly true. Jesus is what is most truly noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Everything else flows from him. Many of us know that this is true. When we consciously dwell on Christ, our joy rises. We can't explain it. It just happens. When we dwell on Christ, our joy rises. Now, undoubtedly, though, this, the, this verse, it does extend to all that is good in Christ's creation. Despite being tainted by the fall, 
the world still contains truth, goodness, beauty, and excellence. And these things are designed to bring us joy. Historically, these things have been, become known as the transcendentals, things that point beyond themselves to God. For example, there is real joy when we see truth prevail over lies. Truthfulness is an attribute of God. It is, it is baked into reality as a good thing. And so when we see truth, it resonates with our souls and it brings us joy because it is going with the grain of the universe rather than against it. Ephesians 6 calls us to be lovers of the truth. There is also this real joy when we see goodness. Goodness is also an attribute of God. When we see leaders behaving nobly, virtuously, standing by ethical principles, that is a good thing. That brings us joy. When we see selfless acts of love, brave heroes, loyal fathers, devoted mothers, that brings us joy because goodness, it is a transcendental quality that points us to God. There's, there's real joy when we see beauty. The stars at night make us say, wow, great music moves us. Great storytelling, it captivates us. When I traveled to America, I was able to see the incredible landscapes in Yellowstone National Park. It moved my soul. It was doing something to me. Because Psalm 19 tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God. Creation contains beautiful, praiseworthy, excellent things. These are things that we need to meditate on. By way of a little case study, you, you might remember if you were with us earlier in chapter 4, Paul mentioned a fallout between these two women, Euodia and Syntyche. Clearly the whole church knew about it. Clearly the whole church was anxious, verse 6. It must have been really easy to just dwell on the drama and division. Some people may have even delighted in dwelling on the drama and the division and just got sucked into a vortex of joylessness. How do they get out? Well, if you're with us, Paul called for a mediator, he calls for prayer, but here in these verses, Paul also calls to focus on what is truly true and good. Perhaps what Euodia and Syntyche most needed was to lift their eyes from the drama and dwell on the gospel to just hear again that they were precious, blood-bought sisters in Christ, that they were both forgiven sinners in need of daily grace, part of the same eternal family, to just repeat those truths to themselves, to meditate on those good realities, because we become the content we consume. We become the content we consume. Now let's get to some concrete application here. Verse 8 tells us to think about such things. Think about such things. Verse 9 then tells us to put them into practice. It's never enough to simply dwell on truth. We need to go out and leave this room and put it into practice. The Christian who knows uh, good truth and good morality but doesn't do it is a fool. But it, it is so easy to do. I know it's so easy to do. We come to church together. We hear these truths from God. We nod along, and then we do nothing different. We don't repent. We don't ask the Spirit to actually change us. We don't, and then we don't see any more joy. Perhaps we wonder why. It's obvious. If we really want to take hold of this joy that Paul is talking about, and, I, and I, we do, don't we all want this kind of joy that transcends any suffering, any situation we're in, to be joyful? We want this. If we really want to take hold of this joy, let's be doers of the word and not just hearers. How do we put these verses into practice in our modern world? I think our modern world presents very specific challenges when it comes to the content we consume. Three things. Bin the mega junk control the complex foods, 
pile on good food. Let's go through those, and they'll make sense as we go. Number one, bin the mega junk. What I basically mean by this when it comes to the content we consume is basically this. Quit porn. Delete the social media app that you don't need. Stop doom scrolling and zombie scrolling for two and a half hours of your day. Decide today to stop consuming content that is obviously harmful to your soul and that is obviously sinful. Do, do whatever you can to avoid content that is obviously against Paul's list here of what is true, what is pure, what is admirable, what is praiseworthy. John Owen famously said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. One practical tip that more and more people are doing nowadays to stop themselves consuming obviously bad content is to never use digital devices in private rooms like bathrooms or the bedroom. Just keep them in the lounge or the office. It's an easy, practical fix that I, I guarantee will probably massively reduce the amount of junk content we're consuming. Help yourself out. Bin the mega junk. Secondly, control the complex foods. The truth is, most of the media we consume is a complex mix of the image of God and our fallen nature weaved together. It is full of both truth and lies. It simultaneously tells us truths about God, ourselves, the world, and where joy is found, and lies about those things. And so we, we need to be discerning. Music is a huge area for discernment and discipleship. Um, a song can simultaneously point us to God with the beauty of its melody, its sound, its arrangement, and yet the lyrics feed us absolute junk. Uh, I could list some of the lyrics from the main stage at Glastonbury this year, but I'll spare you. Um, now that we don't want to be too prescriptive here with what is in, what's out, what genre is better than others, we don't want to be too prescriptive, but let's remember this. Music is designed by God to be moving and memorable. It sticks with us. I have not been careful with this in my life, my teenage years, and my mind, probably 90% of my precious brain uh, is taken up with just nonsense lyrics. I don't think I've been particularly careful with this. Music is designed to move us and be memorable and stick with us. So let's give a little bit of thought about what we fill our minds with, with the music we listen to. I, I don't believe that these verses are saying that we as Christians can't consume pop culture. In many respects, we want to stay actively engaged with culture and even help create it and shape it. Actually, there is always truth, purity, and loveliness in culture because of the image of God. Every movie you've ever watched has truth in it. Every song has goodness weaved in because we can't help but express those things as image bearers of God. We can't help it. But to varying degrees, all media will also have fallenness weaved into it as well. And there will be a line where things basically become too rude, too crude, or too nude. And we need to work out with our conscience and with conversation about what, what is best for us. And just remember, discipleship is never about finding the line and then getting up as close to it as we possibly can. Discipleship is about honestly pursuing Christ in all things. Pursuing Christ in all things. There is loads to talk about here. Um, and I'm hoping that the best time, the best chance for us to do this in an even more concrete way is for you guys to chat over tea and coffee and in home groups this week. Control the complex foods. Thirdly, pile on good food. Pile on good food. The preacher John Piper once said, one of the great uses of social media will be to prove on the last day that prayerlessness was not from lack of time. It's pretty convicting, isn't it? Just about everyone you speak to today feels like they're busy. How are you doing? Busy. 
And yet somehow the average Brit finds two and a half hours for social media, four hours for television, six hours for the internet. Very busy. Perhaps it's not always about lack of time, but lack of desire. How many minutes are we carving out to read the Bible, to speak to our Heavenly Father in prayer, good food? It's funny how often God talks about the Bible as food. Jesus says we cannot live on bread alone. We, we need God's word. Peter said we should crave the Bible like babies crave milk. Jeremiah says, I love this verse, Jeremiah 15, he said, I ate your words and they were joy. I ate your words and they were joy. Isn't that a good verse? Jeremiah 15, 16. Think about how much content you consume every day. We need to make sure that we are piling on good food in good amounts, content that will bring us joy. Obviously, that the principal example of that is undoubtedly God's word in the Bible. And know that Satan will do everything he can to distract you from getting to God's word. We are in a spiritual war. Here are just a few ways that we could suit up. You might laugh at some of these. I'm trying to be concrete so it is, is, is concretely helpful. Get a Bible in multiple rooms of the house. Massively reduce your distractions. Recognize that your phone is a weapon of mass distraction. <laughs> it is hard to do anything uh, let alone extended Bible reading or prayer when a phone is in the room. Especially if you've got good timing. Especially if you've got... <laughs> did someone do that on purpose? Especially if you've got your notifications turned on and you've got angry birds and Wordle pinging up. It's hard to do anything when your phone is in the room. Massively reduce your distractions. Buy an alarm clock for next to your bed so you don't need to have your phone next to you. Apparently something like 75% of us, the first thing we do within about 10 seconds of waking up is grab our phone. Get, a, get an alarm clock, keep your phone downstairs. Delete all of the social media apps that you don't need. Set, you can set time limits on your apps now in the settings. I was a, a, encouraged to do this. I've set a 15 minute timer on most of the apps I need and then it locks me out for the day. It is one of the best things I've ever done. We, could, we want to master our technology and not be mastered by it. Now, I'm, I'm not a technophobe. Before it starts to sound like that, I know that technology can be an excellent help to get us to have good content. And so try and get good apps on your phone. Some that I could uh, encourage you to put on as a Christian is the Bible app, of course. The Bible Project have a great app filled with hundreds of short two or three minute videos that give summaries of books of the Bible, big themes in the Bible. That's the Bible Project. Read Scripture is, uh, is another app that helps with daily Bible readings. Prayer Mate. Lots of you are on Prayer Mate. It's an app that helps you to pray. The Word One to One. It's an app that helps you read the Bible with another person. Step Bible, if you wanted to step it up a notch, Step Bible help, gives you the English translation of the Bible and you can click on the words and see the original language. So if you're doing a Bible study, you can really dive in deep to the, to the words, meditate on a particular word. Of course, podcast, get a, get a good podcast app on your phone. There's all sorts of good podcasts on all, just about every area of Christian discipleship, retirement, parenting, whatever. Get some good podcast apps. We should be trying to start every day by meditating on God's word, by reading something. Just, I know lots of us, vast majority of us, oh, I don't know, I don't want to make an, an, a, an assumption. I imagine a lot of us are already in the habit of reading our Bible most days. If you're not at all, most habit coaches will say that developing a good habit is all about an easy victory. Set yourself a very low bar that's almost impossible to miss. Plan to read the Bible for one minute every day. That is your goal. One minute, everyone can do that, and then just build from there. Build from there. If you struggle with reading, you can get God's Word on audiobooks, read by David Suchet. Even Johnny Cash did an audiobook reading of the New Testament. 
get, get God's word on audiobook, consume good food, pile it on, pile it on. You see, as we come near the end of our studies in joy, at the end of Philippians, as Christians, the truth is, we still have to deal with the same amount of sadness and stress, sin and suffering as everybody else. But we do so with certain game-changing realities. And we should dwell on these things every day. Realities like God knows us and he loves us. That even though we wander from him, God comes after us. That Jesus lived the perfect life I could never live for me. That Jesus died, died my death to take my sin from me. That when God looks at me, he just sees Jesus and he is delighted. That he rose again to give me absolute certainty and hope of eternal life. That he has sent the Spirit to empower me and change me. That we have been adopted into God's global family. That we have an enormous family of brothers and sisters here this morning. That we are on a mission that cannot fail. That God is working everything together for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. And Jesus has prepared a place in heaven for me. The list goes on and on. This is good food. This is the content we want to be consuming every day. And actually, this is, this is, this is the gospel that we want to proclaim to Essex. Out there, people are getting a lot of bad news in here, we have a lot of good news. Out there, things are getting ugly. In here, we want to hold out beauty. Out there, we get a lot of lies. In here, we want to carefully handle the truth. Church, hear God's word to us today. Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy, Think about such things and put them into practice and the peace of and God and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Dear God, we simply want to ask you this morning for your help that we would think on these things and put them into practice. Help us to repent of the bad content we're consuming. Help us to pile on good content for our joy, for your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.